Welcome to the latest episode of the Public Health Insight Podcast. My name is LaShawn, your host for this episode, alongside Gordon and Perva. In this episode, we'll be discussing three important topics that affect our health on a global scale. First, we'll examine Australia's recent decision to ban recreational vaping in an effort to crack down on e-cigarettes. Then, we'll delve into the importance of a public health approach to reducing and preventing firearm violence, an issue that has plagued societies around the world. Finally, we'll discuss the loneliness epidemic in America and explore steps that can be taken to address this growing public health concern. Let's go. Australia is set to ban recreational vaping and tighten e-cigarette laws to curb the rise of teenage vaping. This is the country's biggest crackdown on the tobacco industry in more than a decade. The government plans to ban the import of non-prescription vapes, limit nicotine levels, and restrict the sale of vapes to help smokers quit. Vapes will only be sold in pharmacies and require pharmaceutical-type packaging. Disposable vapes, often popular with young people, will also be banned. Studies have shown the potential of long-term harm from e-cigarettes, which have become a recreational product in Australia and are mostly sold to teenagers and young people, who are three times as likely to take up smoking. Gordon, LaShawn, why is this so important? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. And I think very progressive relative to the other countries Mm -hmm. around the world. Australia, New Zealand have been Mm -hmm. very well known for getting ahead of some of this by having anti-smoking laws, having anti-vape laws, and really protecting the youth. Having things like cartoon characters on vaping packages, but having these colorful fruity Mm -hmm. flavors. Like, come on, if you had like Tony the Tiger or Lucky Charms homie, on your vape, I'd buy mm. it. It looks cool yeah. and enticing, right? So and there's like they're really taking advantage stuff, right? of that. And there's like pink smoke. It looks cool, right? Yeah, it looks cool. Yeah, why not? And that's a problem. So there's a lot of things going on in this article and in the world mm-hmm. of tobacco, nicotine, smoking, vaping. And the important thing here to realize as a concept or an idea is that youth in particular are vaping more than they are smoking commercial cigarettes Mm -hmm. and the challenge here is that smoking rates continue to decline so smoking rates for normal combustible cigarettes so the one that you put the lighter to and it has a flame and there is a corresponding increase in the prevalence of vaping at the same time but because the smoking rates are not falling to the level of which vaping is increasing. It's showing us that more people are taking up vaping, Mm -hmm. especially in our youth. And LaShawn touched on, why is that the case? Well, something so colorful and appealing and attractive could never be harmful, right? That's a false conception with this particular product. And you might ask, okay, well, it's not like a cigarette. There's not the research that we have about the connection to vaping and lung cancers and things of that nature because you're not really burning something. It's an e-cigarette and the vape juices are heated and it produces a vapor. That's not as harmful on the lungs. That's not entirely true. But one thing that is true is that we know that the vaping liquids have nicotine. Mm. Nicotine is a highly addictive chemical Mm -hmm. and Because that is the case, what we see is that youth who vape, they're way more likely to progress to using real commercial cigarettes later on in life. That has a stronger association with lung cancer. And that's Mm -hmm. why Australia has taken the approach of trying to ban vaping, realizing that a lot of work's been done on the tobacco cigarette Mm -hmm. side of things, but there's a rampant market for vaping as well, and youth have access to this. And we don't really want to see this become an issue later in the future. Mm -hmm. I also think there's generally not as much regulation on where you can vape, Mm -hmm. when you can vape. I've seen people, like at least this is for Canada, I'm sure it's the same in Australia. I've seen people vaping in subways, inside schools. This is still something that may have secondhand impacts on those around you. And because there isn't any 
crackdown or regulations. It's almost normalized. Mm-hmm. And part of that, I mean, a lot of experts are talking about this idea that, you know, there are special case uses for using vape right. products. So what are those exactly? Mm-hmm. So, and that's where it gets a little bit sticky, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have people saying or using it as a cessation aid without the care of a healthcare provider. So that's why they're really trying to regulate where you can purchase vaping products that are pharmaceutical grade Mm -hmm. so that there can be a conversation with the pharmacist over the counter and that nature, and maybe with the healthcare provider as like a physician, but that's not the case. These are widely available in settings where anybody can access like convenience stores. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found interesting from this article is that it does seem that there is a ban that already exists that prevents convenience stores from selling it, but yet they still persist to sell it. This challenge is something that's pervasive everywhere in that policies and regulations don't really solve the problem without proper enforcement. Mm -hmm. And then with proper enforcement and regulations, you can have a black market or illicit market where these products are sold, and that's outside of the purview of the regulation in that it's difficult to execute enforcement actions in those contexts. So that's why, in terms of being more progressive, and I'll just say this too, with New Zealand, they've taken, in terms of their whole smoking strategy, which includes cigarettes and Mm e-cigarettes, is that they're doing a progressive age ban where Mm. anybody 14 years or younger think current of, as of this year will never be able to legally acquire any tobacco or nicotine type products mm. well specifically cigarettes i should right, say right. australia hasn't gone that far there's taxation measures that are a part of their strategy it will have some effect but i think it still doesn't address the street access to vaping yeah. products and what <clears throat> is public health's role in enforcing that a similar idea to cigarettes where you get it from family members who have yep, access to that's it. exactly what like happens. That. And I think also, I think the article also touched on the fact that schools are going to be a little stricter with the vaping and all that because mm-hmm. apparently it's bled into behavioral things into schools as well, which is quite sad to see. So making it accessible for those that need it and those that would like to use it as a way of quitting smoking cigarettes. But keeping it from harm's bay for the younger population. Yeah, and and I will say, so the key thing there, Perva, is that the reason that youth should never have access to it is because if it's to be used as a cessation tool, Mm -hmm. it's for people who are currently smoking cigarettes. Yes, yes. So it should never be used as something, as an initiation to starting smoking. It's almost like a gateway. Right? It's (laughs) a gateway. So that's why we're really concerned about the youth numbers. We see this in Canada as well with, Mm -hmm. I've done interviews on a topic too with vaping in school premises that's Mm -hmm. also not allowed in Ontario, Canada and I'm sure many other jurisdictions as well and principals have taken the approach with having policies and suspensions we're hearing from students that that doesn't go far enough too so even like I said it's not permitted on school grounds yet people still do it people Mm -hmm. can get the fines people experience the consequences and yet it still happens so maybe I'll just issue some caution that this is a solution to the problem. The Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, ASTHO, has called for collaborative and multi-sectoral efforts to address the issue of gun violence in the United States, which has become a critical public health and safety concern affecting everyone. With record-setting years of mass shootings in 2021 and 2022, Firearm-related deaths have reached a record high in 2020, with more than 45,000 intentional and unintentional deaths. Of those deaths, 54% were from suicide, 43% from homicide, and 3% were unintentional. Health agencies are implementing upstream approaches to mitigate intergenerational cycles of community violence stemming from systemic racism and historical trauma. Perva, Lashant, what are your reactions to this? Golly. Overdue. (laughs) Wow. Where do we start, right? Yeah. From our context in Canada, we do have obviously gun violence Mm -hmm. to some degree, but not at the scale of what we're seeing in the U.S. What do you you feel about that? One of the things I really liked about this um, new 
approach that they're taking is really focusing Mm -hmm. on survivors and the PTSD they have and also the families that go through this with those survivors it's very obviously incredibly traumatizing experience and the approach of restricting gun violence restricting gun availability is unfortunately very very slow or not progressing so with that in mind there really needs to be that approach on health how can we take care of the people that are facing this that are going through this children and teachers and anyone who's like you know people who are at the mall or wherever the shootings are happening it's a lifelong trauma that they're going to be dealing with and not just them their families too i think this is such a great systemic approach that they're trying to take on improving the outcomes of the individuals that go through or face earth facing end of gun violence in the states one of the things that shocked me was Again, when we're talking about gun violence, I don't know, this might be one of my biases. It's just, I think of adult humans mm. essentially using those guns mm. to do what they have to do with those guns, right? For various reasons. But the stat that stuck out to me was in 2020, firearms were the leading cause of death in children aged 1 to 19. It's so just, think about uh, that. So sad. Out of mm-hmm. all the causes of death, Firearms was the leading cause of right. death. For more than that motor vehicle, more than um, congenital disease, congenital more diseases. than anything. Yeah. Can we talk it, about that? What's going mm, on there? That's scary, man. It's sad. It, I, I've heard that stat before. I think when it had come out in 2020, it just it breaks my heart. And the fact that stats like this still don't cause change. Yeah. It's from 2020. It's been three years, and the violence has really only increased so it's, oh, it's just so sad it breaks yeah and what it does what it does show though is that within the country itself of the u.s and within the global community we're not overreacting to this so yeah. mass shootings at high schools elementary yeah. schools elicits a very visceral and emotional reaction to that specific incident you might say well it happens so infrequently that we mm-hmm. shouldn't worry about it That obviously is not the case, Mm -hmm. but also when it plays out in the numbers as the leading cause of death. I just, uh, The leading cause of death. How can you escape that type of conversation? And keeping in mind, again, recalling that stat, 54% of the deaths in 2020 were from suicide, 43 from homicide, three were unintentional. This is not always mass shootings, right? but it's also that these children have easy access to guns around them. So something that ASTHO was also made a remark that they're going to be working on is how to safely keep these guns, how to safely store them, making sure that children or vulnerable people do not have easy access to them. A really interesting fact that was in this article was also that children that have easy access to guns or they see guns more often around them growing up are more likely to engage in some type of gun violence later on Mm. in life and so working on proper storage of firearms and such is also a really important aspect you know if you can't get rid of the guns at least try and not have them so easily available at home for example Mm -hmm. yeah and when the numbers are teased out like that, perfect, it, it does show where the interventions need to lie. So it shows that the gun safety will only get you so far when you have the suicides, the mass shootings and the unintentional deaths. Mm-hmm. But it also doesn't highlight on the other end of the spectrum. Are these guns that cause these deaths licensed firearms or unlicensed firearms so that gives you an indication as to by implementing stringent gun laws Mm -hmm. what effect we can have on reducing these rates and then knowing what proportion is caused by firearms that are not licensed Mm -hmm. if you regulate the licensed firearms then it won't really necessarily have an effect on that piece so there's a lot going on here it's outside of my expertise i will say and superimposing all of that on constitutional rights and those types of things, it gets a little bit tricky to have those discussions. But I really like that this article talked about addressing the root factors and talked about public health's role within that. And from a 
violence reduction strategies yes. perspective and take the conversation away from the guns themselves to mm -hmm. what the perpetuates people. violence. Yep. And I think that's probably the lane that public health should pursue. There's a lot of different forces at play at the gun level. And I think if we can mitigate that earlier, then we could probably have a, a better yeah. effect on that. I really appreciate it. It wasn't, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, they're not restricting, they're making blah, blah, blah. I understand. Mm -hmm. But their approach was, okay, we cannot solve that part of it. What can we fix and how can we make the situation better? How can we try and focus on the people that are affected and be able to do the certain parts of this specific issue without that part that we don't have a control over at this moment in time? So I think it's a great approach and I honestly I was very pleased with the article reading the plan of action that there and I'm really hoping it turns out really well so I liked your analysis focusing on the people that are affected by gun violence but I think it's also important to talk about some of those policy legacies mm. Mm. and when we're talking about a key kind of policy we always go back to the Dickey Amendment Mm. You remember that, Gordon? Dickey Amendment. That's old school. That's old like, school. Yeah, back, like in 19, back in 1996. Yeah. It's very old school. <laughs> so again, just as a reminder, this was a law that was put into the U.S. where it deterred people from actively advocating or promoting gun control. Mm. And it basically led into there being less research done into gun violence in the United States. Yeah. And if you don't have that core foundational research to support an issue you're trying to advocate for, mm -hmm. it sure as hell makes it pretty hard to do anything about it. Very true, very true. You don't know what you don't measure. The United States is facing an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. According to a new advisory from the U.S. Surgeon General, with about half of the U.S. adult population reporting measurable levels of loneliness even before the COVID-19 pandemic. The physical consequences of poor connection can be devastating, including an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and dementia. The report finds lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The advisory outlines the framework for a new national strategy based on six foundational pillars. The report also warns that loneliness isn't uniquely an American problem, but a feature of modern life worldwide. And it calls for creating a culture of connection to tackle the problem. Gordon, Perva, is this nothing, something, or everything? Mm. The fact that it's something that has been showcased before COVID-19 is also that's what kind of threw me off I was like yeah I know COVID-19 loneliness has been so big since then but the fact that they have they've been studying it since before COVID and they know that it's been increasing since then very interesting exciting stuff to be honest to be I think yeah. one okay let me you talk about one it's exciting stuff loneliness is exciting stuff. no exciting <laughs> stuff that they're acting on it because I okay. find so mm. I think Generally, when we talk about loneliness in America, I always think about how it's generally quite an individualistic society, right? Like there's the idea of mm. your home, your core family, you're encouraged to move out, live on your own, all this type of stuff. And that can lead to a lonely lifestyle if you do not have mm. good friends and you don't have a good support system. It can be quite lonely, even if you have like lots and lots of people you talk to but the quality of connection is not quality the same over quantity exactly that can create a lot of loneliness and the fact that they're taking steps that they're recognizing it and they're taking steps to improve that's what's exciting specifically what i really liked is the enacting of the pro connection public spaces which if you're into urban planning by the way is mm. very important a lot of american cities including canada we talk about it's not made for people, made for cars. Mm. You don't have a third place to call home. You've got your home, you've got your workplace. You don't have a third place to mm. exist where you can usually find community. Mm. And for kids, that can be parks. For people, that could be public libraries. It can be areas where you go out and play basketball every weekend. Those things are becoming less and less, especially in the States. And so actively recognizing that and trying to make it more available 
fantastic point. I really liked that part. Why don't you talk about the other parts that you like, Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I like this part, but I will mm. say for someone who's never smoked a day in their life and you're now telling me that if I'm lonely, that's just as bad as 15 mm -hmm. cigarettes a day. That's a little bit yeah. disconcerting or mm -hmm. unsettling to hear. Mm -hmm. I think what they were trying to underscore, though, is the importance of social connection on maintaining your health yeah. beyond just exposure to chemicals or substances too it, it, that's not the only thing that determines health mm -hmm. the strength of our social connections also determines health it was a bit surprising to hear too about increased risk of heart disease stroke and dementia from loneliness and one of the things i thought about regarding this in relation to a book i'm reading called free economics where they really talk about not making the mistake to have causal linkages between two things without knowing modifiable factors in between. Mm. So is it that people who tend to be lonely are more unhealthy in general and that's the loneliness itself is not the thing that's causing those health outcomes? I think I would like to see that tease out a little bit more because we might be providing misleading information. They also did talk about specifically, it's not about the quantity of the connections, but the quality. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I appreciated too, that for those people who might hear about loneliness and they might be told, hey, you need to have more friends, you need to have this. It's, it's not necessarily about that. It's about having deep and meaningful connections with people rather than the amount. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my takeaway from reading this. Fully agree. Uh, the smoking 15 cigarettes a day fact, I would be, love to see where they've made that connection, to be fully honest. But they do mention that the loneliness epidemic has seen an increase in depression rates and social anxiety and things like that. Something, nothing or everything for you, LaShawn? Well, here's the thing. Mm. I was listening to an interview with Dr. Vivek Murthy, the mm. U.S. Surgeon General, and one of the things he said stuck out to me about the gravity of the situation. Most of the struggling when it comes to loneliness is happening in silence. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to talk about this because if you're talking about this, does this make you not a fun person to hang out with? Are you not mm. well liked? So there's a lot of social stigma about desirability. It as well. Exactly. Mm. And that's why a lot of people are struggling in silence. It's mm. one in two mm -hmm. adults. That's yeah, quite, quite, quite concerning. And the article mentions these six pillars, and Perva mentioned one of them. So. Mm -hmm. Some of the pillars are strengthening social infrastructure, so parks, libraries, to have these pro-social connections, enacting pro-connection public policies at every level. So really talk about things like how does public transport work in the community? How does the family leave work? Is there paid family leave to allow for more social connection? What about the medical needs that stem mm -hmm. from social isolation and loneliness? And really having a conversation about reforming digital environments. Mm. So what does that mean? Right? It, we know that texting and having text-based communications is not the same as having in-person conversations. You're not hearing their voice. You're not seeing body language. And as a human species, we've evolved to have those in-person interactions. Homies weren't texting back in the day mm. 10,000 years ago, let alone like 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, right? So we have to keep that in mind as well when we're talking about our relationship with technology and then really deepening our understanding in this issue, right? This is a more recent phenomenon in which we're starting to address it as an issue. So let's continue doing this research and ultimately, as a human society, create this culture of connectedness. In this episode, we talked about Australia's recent decision to ban recreational vaping in an effort to crack down on e-cigarettes. We then talked about the importance of a public health approach to reducing and preventing firearm violence. And then finally, we discussed the loneliness epidemic in America, and we explored steps that could be taken to address this growing public health concern. All the links of these articles we discussed are in the description. Until next time... LaShawn, Perva, and Gordon, signing out. Bye. Peace. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our podcast, be sure to subscribe 
and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. See you in the next one.